Heaven Sent. There have been many different development studios throughout the broad history of gaming who have done their part in shaping the industry and spawning the very genres that we love in present day. From Nintendo's introduction of the platformer genre with the 1981 release of Donkey Kong to the 1970s Sega classic Jet Rocket, which is alleged to be the very first open world game, what I'm getting at is every studio wants to have that big breakthrough game, the one that really shakes things up for the gaming industry and has consumers all over the world in awe at its creation. Now there's been a lot of legendary IPs and genres created up to this point, but we know who to give flowers to when it comes to certain styles of games. Much like Capcom is well known for their innovation in the genre of survival horror, when it comes to RPGs, I'm willing to bet that most gamers will give their love to none other than Square Enix, as they've created one of the most widely beloved role-playing series of all time, that being Final Fantasy. Now, Square Enix is a studio that carries a legendary catalog of classic games on its roster, and many of which I'm extremely fond of. But before they were a household name for gamers all over the globe, they started with much more humble beginnings, initially being named Square, or internationally known as Squaresoft. Squaresoft had started as a software subsidiary of Den Yu Sha, which simply put, was an electric company. Den Yu Sha was owned by a man named Kunichi Miyamoto, whose son, Masafumi Miyamoto, was employed in the software development branch. Masafumi wasn't too keen on following in the steps of his father, and was much more interested in the rise of the video game industry at the time. While most games in the early 80s were developed by single programmers, Masafumi believed that games were about to be evolving in a big way, and with this evolution would require a much larger team of writers, artists, and programmers to create games with much more depth than ever before seen. He had his eyes set to the future of gaming, and was looking to create something legendary. Taking note of then standalone game studio Enix and the commercial success of their game Dragon Quest, Masafumi was interested in getting into the realm of role-playing games and having his company create one for themselves. All of these ambitions came to fruition in 1987 with the debut release of Final Fantasy on the Nintendo Entertainment System. The game was incredibly well received and had become the poster child of Square in their long run of successful releases throughout the 80s and 90s. And while Final Fantasy is probably their most well-known IP, they were responsible for other great RPG series such as Chrono Trigger, Parasite Eve, and Xenogears, all with their own collective of fans and followings. But with the new millennium on the horizon for Squaresoft in the late 90s, they felt it was time for them to branch out to the next generation of consoles and create something fresh for their fans to enjoy upon the release of the highly anticipated PlayStation 2. But in order to do so, they felt they would need a little bit of help. This help came in the form of Dream Factory, a low-key Japanese development studio that was best known for their work in the fighting slash beat 'em up titles. With prior experience in creating fighting games such as Tobol No. 1, Square felt that Dream Factory would be a great fit in helping them to develop their next big game. And that brief historical narrative is what leads us to the very subject of this video. A game that was Square's first big introduction into the world of beat 'em up style games, and is a title that can really divide a room in terms of whether it was good or just plain garbage. I personally happen to have a bit of experience with this game, but that was so long ago, I felt that it was time to refresh my memory and step into this video with some fresh but well-seasoned gaming knowledge. So without further ado, let's step inside the hilariously strange world of The Bouncer, as we come to find why some gamers hold this game in such high regards, while others… well, let's just take a look, shall we? Right from the jump, I love the cheesy 80s styles fast paced music they used for the intro cutscene. Paired with the stylish Squaresoft aesthetic and that early 2000s flair, it's just chef's kiss, man. Even the introduction screen goes pretty hard. The Bouncer. Now, if you guys have been rocking with me since my previous videos, you know how much I appreciate a dope title screen. And for some reason, the simplicity of this one with the sounds of the menu scrolling, it's making me all tingly inside. Ah, uh, I could listen to that all day. But anyways, it looks like we've got three different modes to play around with, but we're here to get into the meat and bones of the bouncer. So let's go with the story mode for now. Starting with the intro cutscene, we're met with a news broadcast, commentating on some new tech at the hands of the Mikado Corporation. A mysterious woman is typing away on her laptop and surveying a young woman by the name of Dominique Cross. 
cut to a couple of military s choppers dropping off a squad of what looks to be a BDSM themed skiing team as they make their way towards Dominique's location. Shortly after, we meet our first bouncer by the name of Volt as he greets Dominique and lets her into the bar. We then meet Ko and Sion, completing our trio of playable characters. And if you haven't already noticed, Sion looks a hell of a lot like Sora. That's because they were both designed by the legendary Tetsuya Nomura, the man responsible for the very same character designs in Kingdom Hearts. So if anything, it looks like Sora may have been inspired by Sion. But anywho, Sion is then greeted with a present from Dominique for his one year anniversary of working in the bar. It's a dog street chain, which is the street in which the bar is located. And just as he's receiving this gift, the angry squad of Marilyn Manson backup dancers come busting through the glass ceiling, propelling us into our first choice of battle. As before each battle, you get to choose which character you want to fight as. Me personally, I stuck with Sion and started mashing away. Now as you can see, the combat in this game is a bit wonky. If I had to compare it to anything, it's almost like trying to throw a punch in your dreams. I mean, you'd have better luck with connecting the airplane Wi-Fi than connecting a punch in this game. You suck. Each button serves a specific punch or kick, with the R1 button being used to string together special moves into your combos. But having just started, my character has yet to learn any of these special moves, so I'm just going to keep repeating what works. Now while this isn't the worst combat I've ever dealt with in a game before, it could have greatly benefited from the use of a lock on system, much like Devil May Cry or other similar third person games have. It's just plain annoying at times with how uncoordinated your character feels during combat, and for this to be our action packed introduction into the game, I was a bit disappointed. Now Dominique is eventually taken by the leather bound goons, and taken to the Mikado Corp's hideout. Ko calls up a connection he has on the inside, and finds a train the boys can board to gain access into the headquarters. En route, the boys are once again intercepted by another group of baddies, and we're able to once again pick which character we want to play for this battle. This mechanic I found to be pretty cool, as each character piqued my interest for different reasons, and I was curious to play all of them. I went with Volt for our second round, and found his moveset to be more satisfying than Sion's. I mean, belly flop for the win. Upon completing this fight, the boys spot a mysterious Black Panther watching over them from above. I guess this is a normal occurrence in their society, as they quickly brush it off, making their way towards the train station. After fighting our way through a slew of train station guards and hopping aboard, we're finally met with our first boss battle, who happens to be an old acquaintance of Volt. So nice to see you again, Echidna. Now this fight was the moment I realized how annoying the combat is in this game, because it was way harder than it should have been to beat this woman. Pause. Not only were my AI controlled teammates using their chins to block her attacks, but they were also standing there helpless as I did the very same with my chin. It took me about three different tries with constant blocking and cheap shots to finally beat her, but when I did, I just felt more flustered than accomplished. Now all the while that I'm playing this game, I want to hate it, I really do. But something about its beautiful 2000s era graphics and dope looking characters just kept me in the mood to keep trucking along. And pairing that with the dope soundtrack and beautifully scripted cutscene transitions, the game was making me fall in love with each passing minute. It's a very conflicting feeling to love a game that's so poorly designed, but something about this game just feels so nostalgic. Now throughout each level, you're able to utilize XP earned to increase the abilities of each character. Maximizing your health, learning new moves, and going up in rank are all incentives to keep playing. The game makes use of a continued save, meaning that after you complete the game, you can use those upgraded characters in the new story mode. This progression is pretty satisfying, and I can definitely see it giving you a reason to play through the story mode multiple times. But as you're watching my gameplay, you'll come to find proof of what most people have complained about this game for. The absurd amount of cutscenes. Now Squaresoft are no strangers to long and frequent cutscenes, but in the sense of a game like The Bouncer, where you spend about 45 seconds in repetitive beat em up gameplay, and then 5 to 10 minutes in a long cutscene, this makes immersing yourself in the gameplay kind of difficult. Where with most games cutscenes are used to kind of transition and help pad along the long spurts of gameplay, in The Bouncer, it just feels like the gameplay is interrupting the cutscenes. You'll catch yourself admiring the beautiful animations, enjoying the witty dialogue and immersing yourself in the strange story, and then BAM! Character select screen, 30 seconds of fighting, and then back to another long cutscene. 30 seconds of fighting, cutscene, fighting, cutscene, rinse, repeat. It just felt lazy if I'm being honest, 
If they'd spent half as much time on improving the gameplay and giving the player more variety to work with, this game could have really been something. I mean, it's like I'm watching a movie with interactive loading screens, essentially. There's no puzzle solving, no interactive environments, no deep-rooted exploration. Just point A to point B, button mash and spin kick your way through this mob, watch a cool video, then do it all over again. Now this game's saving grace for me at least was definitely in its narrative, as there's many twists and turns throughout the story, showing that each character has a lot more to do with this situation than you may have expected. In between levels, the game makes use of loading screens that display flashback dialogue from the three bouncers, giving you a little more insight into their past, which I thought was a nice way of keeping the story interesting, as well as a way to connect the dots as you progress. Now I don't want to spoil too much about the game in the case that you want to give it a playthrough for yourself, but I personally found myself enjoying the story, and while it may be a bit predictable at times, it still had plenty of charm surrounding it to keep me entertained. And man, them jiggle physics ain't half bad either. How you doing? Now as for the other game modes, we've got Versus and Survival Mode. Versus allows up to 4 players to battle it out BR style, or team up for 2v2 action. There are up to 15 players from throughout the story to choose from, as well as 11 different locales to fight in. This is a pretty cool little game mode, and I could definitely see it being fun to play with friends back in the day. Survival mode is your typical horde style gameplay, where you will move through multiple areas fighting waves of enemies on one health bar. It's basically a replay of some of the later areas in story mode, but with the scoring system. These extra modes are appreciated and fit in nicely to add more replayability, but given that the fighting is still incredibly awkward in this game, I don't really know what to make of it. Overall, I found the bouncer to be an acquired taste, so if you're looking for a game that brings next level fighting mechanics, deep rooted gameplay, or just anything above average, well, I couldn't honestly recommend this game to you in good faith. But if you're a fan of early 2000s nostalgia, charming cutscenes, as well as beautiful character and level design, then I think you'll enjoy your stay. The game also has an incredibly short length, meaning you could easily beat it in a 1-2 to hour session, which in my opinion is a good thing, since the game plays out more so like a movie than anything else. Plus, the end credit soundtrack is more than worth getting to hear. What a banger. I would say The Bouncer is more of a niche title that has grown a bit of a cult following, it's a game that deserves a lot of the flack that it gets, due to its lackluster gameplay. Overall, it's a terribly flawed game wrapped up in a neat little package, but it's one that I feel you will enjoy. Plus, combining RPG elements into a beat em up title, that's a pretty cool little feat they achieved. So kudos on that. But my verdict stands. The Bouncer. Good or bad? I'm gonna say, so bad that it's good. Now if any of you watching this video have any prior experience with the game, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear what you guys gotta say about it. Maybe I'm just shallow for being so in love with the visuals to overlook such bad gameplay, but who knows. I like what I like. So I know I said I wasn't gonna upload a video this week, but I just couldn't leave you guys hanging. I hope you guys enjoyed this video half as much as I enjoyed sitting in my room for almost 24 hours making it. We're getting ready to creep up on 6k subs, and I just can't thank you guys enough for all the support you've continued to show my channel. All I've ever wanted to do is build a community of people who love gaming just as much as I do, and thanks to your guys' support, I'm able to do that now, and it just feels amazing to have so many people showing love and, you know, commenting and just making me feel good. But anyways, I hope to see you guys in the next video and um, please leave a comment down below if you have any experience with the bouncer. I'd love to hear, you know, your opinion on the game. But anyways, take care guys and stay blessed. See y'all next time. Peace out.